All right. My name is Eric Alexander, and I'm executive director of the Brigham Education Institute. So welcome you to join us today for a, a new two-part series from a great speaker and a great medical educator. And I'm not going to take too much time, but rather just to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Martin Puchich, who uh, kind of came on the scene uh, together with me when I when the BEI was starting and has been a, a wonderful resource and friend just for bouncing ideas off and is a true medical leader in terms of education and education theory. Uh, and into practice, and uh, is an emergency medicine uh, professor at uh, Children's Hospital, uh, again, an educator in so many different levels, and now overseeing the master's in medical education at Harvard Medical School. So i um, always eager to see what you put together. Martin, this is a great topic, uh, and thank you so much for taking the time. I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> Thank, thank you so much, Eric. Um, so I, as as Eric said, I'm a pediatric emergency doctor and an educator, and I you know kind of worry a lot about health professions education and how to how to do that better. And we do research along those lines. What I am not is a neuroscientist. And so that, um, you know, kind of the neurons, how those neurons work, how synapses work and, you know, kind of uh, neurotransmitters um, on down the line, let alone mapping the brain and, and being able to tell which part of the brain moves your left fifth finger. Um, that ain't me. And, um, and yet, you know, increasingly, I've been interested in the way our world of health professions educators intersects with that of the neuroplasticity people. And so that, um, so I'm a pediatrician. And so pediatricians, you know, in early childhood development worry a lot about neuroplasticity and the ability of the brain to overcome certain deficits. And, um, and, uh, and you know, kind of had this in pediatric school sense of what neuroplasticity was about. And, um, and I've carried that for a lot of years, but over recently there have been changes in the way we think about neuroplasticity. And that that those changes are, I would claim, are relevant to the way you and I practice education. And so what I want to do with this session is play. And what I'd like to do is play with, um, you know, kind of some of these neuroplasticity ideas and then to see how they relate to what you and I do in our education practices. And so the... Um, Let's see if this doesn't crash as I go along. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna first show a video of um, or or basically show you what a remarkable thing the brain is. And so I'm gonna just change the sharing to I'm gonna try out this video. Where's those going? There it is. Okay, so so I'm a Canadian. Canadians watch hockey. I've watched thousands of hockey games, and I happen to watch this game live. And in this game, it's the Edmonton Oilers against the New York Rangers, and the Rangers are up by one with three minutes left in the game. And so the so the Oilers put on their star, Connor McDavid, and so that um, so you can see him here. And um, and he's meant to go on and do Connor McDavid kind of things. And what you're going to see, and I'm going to show it to you a couple of times, just to, in in terms of this is, um, and I know Kent Hecker's on the line. He's from Calgary. And he can't stand watching the Edmonton Oilers, and so I'm sorry about that, Kent. But um, but bear with me. Um, what you're going to see is an athlete at apex ability. An athlete who, um, with the, basically his brain, is going to create a play that um, that is zero conscious thought, but an incredible display of perception and then action as you go along. And so, um, so the point I want to make is basically the Connor McDavid, the athlete, goes in from here and goes against four Rangers and and dekes every single one of them out, and then finishes by deking the goalie and scores. And if you think of the millisecond to millisecond to millisecond, you know, kind of thought process and what's going on in terms of him coordinating his behaviors, his muscles, his actions, his um, his deceptions of these other players and with each of the players trying to get in his way, this is a miracle. 
And, um, and, you know, I, I think that when we train physicians to detect subtle diagnoses in the middle of a noisy, noisy environment, it's a similar thing that we're trying to trying to do. Here's another example from music. Okay, so this is um, three seconds of music. And so that um, so it's in a piece by Liszt and um, and is piano music. And so that the left hand is uh, is that lower line and the right hand is the upper line. So imagine what a miracle it is, is that we can over time gradually shape a brain to do something as different as sort of um, processing 1800 notes per minute, which is what this represents, um, as well as Connor McDavid making his way through that um, through that gauntlet of the of the New York Rangers. And so th so this is what neuroplasticity is, is that is that the person who can play this musical pieces brain is so much different from Connor McDavid's brain as 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 they go about their individual particular things. And so that in this talk, what I'm going to try and make the point of is, is that we're molding these brains on a microscopic millisecond kind of fashion. And what does what does that perspective do to the way you and I teach? And so that um, so I'm going to go through and we're going to define neuroplasticity for ourselves. Then I'm going to show you because I'm not a neuroplastician, um, some videos of leading lights in terms of this um, this research. And then um, and then having looked at those videos and thought about neuroplasticity more, then I propose we regroup and think about the implications for us as educators. And so that um, so we'll do some breakout groups at that point. Okay, so um. So here's the case I would have you consider, and we're just going to read this, but we're not going to consider it till the end. But it's already been a busy night in the emergency department when they roll a patient into, into the crash room in full arrest. The room is the usual helpful chaos, and amongst the 32 people in the room are two medical students, and they're plastered against the back wall trying to stay out of the way. The charge nurse, who's basically the traffic cop, wants them out. You're the teaching position and amidst your sort of various duties and, and the like, um, do you use social capital to keep the medical students in there? Is it an educational experience for them? Or do you or do you follow the lead of the of the um, of the charge nurse and take them out of the room? I'm gonna make a neuroplasticity argument at the end. Okay. So let's go through and now talk about neuroplasticity. What I'd like you to do is in the chat, put down your particular definition of neuroplasticity, the way you think about it, even if it's just to make up neuro and plastic and what that um, what those clues are for you. The brain can adapt to change and makes its best attempt to learn. Capacity of keeping learning endlessly. Um, the natural ability of the brain to wire and rewire itself given change and challenge. The property of the brain to alter its wiring. This wiring metaphor that we can change that and bring it across. Changes in brain dynamics. Similarly, new neural co connections throughout life. Lose it, use it or lose it type of thing and adaptability. Exactly. I think I think you guys are right on in terms of that. We're going to refine that um, even more as we go along. Here's what the Oxford English Dictionary calls it. And so that the ability of the brain to form and reorganize synaptic connections, especially in response to learning or experience or following injury. And so that um, so here in this definition are two interesting aspects to it in the sense of, you know, kind of the motivation behind this talk to think about in terms of learning or experience. So we don't think of ourselves as educators whose job is neuroplasticity. And yet that's going to be the claim. And but we do think about neuroplasticity in terms of injury. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but um, but uh, but it is um, a definite feature to neuroplasticity, and so that um, so there are thought to be, you know, the two different kinds of plasticity, structural and functional. 
And so that um, structural plasticity is where we remodel our brains. And in this in this three panel thing, in the middle panel there where it says type one structural plasticity, it alludes to the fact that children have incredibly plastic brains. We're going to talk about that in a second. And um, and they mold their brains to their environment um, in a way that we all acknowledge. When's the best time to learn a language? It's when you're two. And the um and that kind of thing. But the the um the authors of this graphic have intentionally put grandpa in there as well. And so that um so with the claim being that um that neuroplasticity applies to us all the way along. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then this functional neuroplasticity is when you damage one part of the brain, can another part of the brain take over and take over the functions of the part that you lost? And the most fascinating um, part of the, or one of the most fascinating examples of this is phantom limb pain. When you cut off somebody's limb, the representation of that limb remains in the brain. And so that the brain has a difficult time with that because he thinks it's still there because it still has the representation in the brain. And that can cause all sorts of um, all sorts of problems. And so um, so uh, so let's um, let's say uh, so another example of this and the, the way I thought about neuroplasticity before was this study of London taxi drivers. And so they did a study in which they compared London taxi drivers. Remember, London taxi drivers are kind of apex taxi drivers who really have a great knowledge of um, what goes on in the um, with the spatial relationships of London, England, at least before GPS was invented. And they compared them to London bus drivers. And so bus drivers have do the same route over and over again, but they match these drivers based on, you know, kind of stress and, you know, kind of seniority and driving experience and, and a bunch of things along those lines. And they put them into a functional MRI and compared their brains. And, um, and to quote them, we examined the contribution of these factors um, who were matched for driving experience, yada, yada. And we found that compared with bus drivers, taxi drivers had greater gray matter volume in the mid-posterior hippocampi and less volume in the anterior hippocampi. And so that uh, furthermore, years of navigation experience correlated with hippocampal gray matter only in taxi drivers with the right posterior gray matter volume increasing and anterior volume decreasing with more navigation experience. And so in the same way that an athlete who pumps weights will have a stronger bicep in, uh, in consequence, what, um, what I took as neuroplasticity being that if you used a certain muscle, quote unquote, a certain part of your brain, that that part of the brain would grow and become um, more and more well-developed and bring you across. And that certainly seems to be supported by this you know, kind of rough um, study comparing bus drivers to taxi drivers and has the has us thinking about the difference in terms of um in terms of uh, the plasticity of the brain but the um but it's richer than that even and so that um so that's where we're going to now go into some videos of these um important investigators who have um who have um, you know, kind of worked harder on this and so this first one michael merzenich um, was uh, is a UCLA professor who did studies on animals mapping out um, the way this worked. And, uh, and his research was uh, really, really important in the development of cochlear implants. And so think about the cochlear implant. What, what that is, is basically a, a, thing, a transducer that converts sound waves into electricity. And then you ram the wire from the cochlear implant into your acoustic nerve. And then the pattern of electrical impulses that your little, you know, sort of cochlear implant generates, eventually your brain decodes those patterns so that you can listen to music. So the, you know, kind of it, it is such a non-intuitive leap, all told, that just stimulating your acoustic nerve in a way that has enough gradations that your brain can start to learn that 
this sound corresponds to you know kind of a car that sound corresponds to a, a, a bird and so on you know kind of can in its full flower be use all of the machinery of the of the brain and so that um so that was the you know kind of a end result of Merzenich's um Merzenich's, uh, research and so so I'm going to stop sharing now and if um if uh Caitlin you can bring up that first video performance that apply to musical performance. From these studies, we define two great epochs of the plastic history of the brain. The first great epoch is commonly called the critical period, and that's the period in which the brain is setting up in its initial form, its basic processing machinery. This is actually a period of dramatic change in which it doesn't take learning per se to drive the initial differentiation of the machinery of the brain. All it takes, for example, in the sound domain, is exposure to sound. And the brain actually is at the mercy of the sound environment in which it, it, in which it is reared. So for example, I can rear an animal in an environment in which there's meaningless dumb sound, a repertoire of sound that I make up, that I make just by exposure, artificially important to the animal and its young brain. And what I see is that the animal's brain sets up this initial processing of that sound in a form that's idealized within the limits of its processing achievements to represent it in an organized and orderly way. Uh, the sound doesn't have to be valuable to the animal. I can raise the animal in something that could be hypothetically valuable, like the sounds that simulate the sounds of a native language of a child, and I see the brain actually develop a processor that's specialized, specialized for that complex array or repertoire of sounds. It actually exaggerates their separateness of representation in multidimensional neuronal representational terms. Or I can expose the animal to a completely meaningless and destructive sound. I can raise an animal under conditions that would be equivalent to raising a baby under a moderately loud ceiling fan in the presence of continuous noise. And when I do that, I actually specialize the brain to be a master processor for that meaningless sound. And I frustrate its ability to represent any meaningful sound as a consequence. Such things in the early history of babies occur in really big, real babies. And they account for, for example, the beautiful evolution of a language-specific processor in every normally developing baby. And so do they also account for development of defective processing in, the, in a substantial population of children who are more limited as a consequence in their language abilities at an older age. Now, in this early period of plasticity, the brain actually changes outside of a learning context. I don't have to be paying attention to what I hear. I don't, the, the input doesn't really have to be meaningful. I don't have to be in a behavioral context. And I, this is required so that the brain sets up its processing so that it can act differentially, so that it can act selectively, so that the creature that, that wears it, that carries it, can begin to operate on it in a selective way. In the next great epoch of life, which applies for most of life, the brain is actually refining its machinery as it masters a wide repertoire of skills and abilities. And in this epoch, which extends from late in the first year of life to death, it's actually doing this under behavioral control. And that's another way of saying that the brain has strategies that... What was that? Sorry. Um, okay, yeah, keep going to 836. Thanks. Okay. ...define the significance of the input to the brain. And it's focusing on skill after a skill or skill after ability after ability under a specific attentional control. And it's a function of where, whether a goal in a behavior is achieved or whether the brain is, or this, uh, the individual is rewarded in the behavior. This is actually a, a very powerful, this lifelong capacity for plasticity for brain change is powerfully expressed and it's the basis of our real differentiation. One so any reactions to what you heard? I wish I had learned a second language at age one or two. The brain was welcoming it in at that moment. <clears throat> Notice, you know, what, what I'm hoping that you'll you'll leave here with is um, is this notion that there are two great epochs of neuroplasticity. And so that when I was trained as a pediatrician, that first epoch was all pla all the plasticity you had, and the um and so that uh, so that you, and um and that first epoch notice that it's not under learning conditions. You drop the person into an environment, and they soak up 
what, what is in the environment and they tune their sensory processing in order to be able to create the finest grained picture of that particular environment that they possibly can. And so in that first epoch, it's like a tuning of the, of the system to the particular environment that that child is growing in. And it does that over a one to five year period. And at the five year period, it, it eventually figures out that I am as well tuned as I possibly can be it's in this passive kind of sense. And so that it's it's building its processor that it's going to use for the rest of its life for a different kind of neuroplasticity. But this first kind of plasticity is, is just soaking and tuning and tuning the thing as you go along. And so that it blows, it blew my mind that difference between the two, because the, um, you know, I'd always known as a pediatrician that we had to worry about how well someone, someone could hear in their first years of life. And so that if you had a middle ear and effusion, if you had cleft lip and palate so that you couldn't hear well, then that had all sorts of implications for how you developed language. And his example of a ceiling fan that sits there and adds a layer of noise between you and the environment ends up clouding the environment, and making it impossible for you to be able to bring the um, distinguish well the things. And so you can't build your processor in a in a high resolution manner, and so that um, so that um, so that you're impaired from in that sense. So, does that make sense? And so that um, so that that first part is a completely different kind of plasticity to the plasticity we're going to talk about amongst adults. Other reflections? Do you know how many words a child hears in a in a in a well-off home in the first five years? A million. 30 million. And so that, um, and there's wide variability. And so that you can range from a child who has failure to thrive in a deprived environment, and that brain will be damaged forever. And um, as opposed to, you know, kind of those people walking around with baby Mozart videos and, the, and all that kind of stuff, you know, kind of, I thought, ah, that's crazy. And the whole bit, it may not be you know, sort of in terms of the way that you set up this, this incredible processor and you have this limited time zone. I, I have my own personal experience in that my, my oldest son was dyslexic, profoundly dyslexic. And it, and it, a pediatrician's son, and we only figured this out when he was, you know, kind of six going on to seven. And the, um, and, uh, but the, you know, kind of neurocog people said, ah, no problem. And so I was like, what do you mean? And so that um, so that they will drill it out of them. And so that they went through these brain training things, the Orton Gillingham program, and they completely rewired him. He went on to become a comp lit major and did a master's degree in American literature, which prompted some discussion in his Canadian household, but um, but all good, you know, kind of um, in that sense. And so that um, so that that, um, you know, kind of uh, your wiring initially off and the fact that we can do something about that wiring is the hopeful message of this particular um, this particular thing. And Martin, I, I think I know where you, what your dancer, but. Here we're talking about verbiage and words and exposure to what you're hearing in particular and how you put together the world. But what about the other four or more senses and, and the integration there? Thank you for the segue. Take it away, Caitlin. Can you show the, um, the next video? Everyone has had some kind of an experience feeling something kind of like fear of heights and it makes perfect common sense that we shouldn't jump over the edge of a drop off because it's dangerous and if it's dangerous then we should probably be afraid of it. Probably. Exactly how and when this hypothetical fear develops makes for pretty gleeful research inside Dr. Karen Adolph's lab. We're discovering some surprising things that are flying in the face of, you know, how people have studied locomotion for the last hundred years. 
including what babies do and feel when they're on a ledge. So the story about fear of heights is that there was a very, very famous classical study in developmental psychology by Gibson and Locke in 1960 that showed that human infants and infants of a number of different species will avoid crossing over an apparent drop-off from what they called a visual cliff. As soon as a baby can move about, it can be observed in the same way as other animals. It's a, a glass table, and on one side there's a checkerboard pattern surface right under the glass. The other side of the table, the pattern surface is way down on the floor, so visually it looks like a big three-foot drop-off. So when human babies first begin crawling, most of them will crawl over the apparent drop-off, but after several weeks of crawling experience, then they'll begin to refuse to crawl over the drop-off. And the conventional interpretation of this was that infants are avoiding the drop-off because they're afraid of height. She's backing away. <laughs> no, she's not interested. She in wants crawling. no part of that side. On, the experiment Jimmy. became the shaky foundation for the myth that crawling innately teaches us to fear heights. Babies avoid going over the drop-off because they're afraid of heights. How do we know they're afraid of heights? Because they avoid crawling over the drop-off. So as you may have noticed, the argument is circular. As it happened, the visual cliff was a better test of an infant's depth perception, not their fear of heights. And if you look closely, you may have actually noticed that the babies don't look particularly scared. It is a perfectly safe surface of support. So after one trial, human infants cleverly figure this out, and then they will crawl over the drop-off. So how do you really test if a baby is scared of heights? You can test babies at the edge of a real cliff where there's no safety glass. It's just an actual drop-off, and the drop-off can be adjustable, so it can be little or really, really big. And why stop there? Inside Dr. Adolph's Infant Action Lab, babies are tested on a variety of apparatuses. You can test babies at the edge of a slope, so it can be steeper, 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 crossing bridges that are wide or narrow over a surface of support, and so on. If there's no safety glass, you can test the same baby dozens on dozens and dozens of trials in the same session. And that means that you can determine for each individual infant when they think that that surface is safe and when they think it's risky within a couple of degrees of accuracy, like two degrees of accuracy for a slope. Dr. Adolph has spent 25 years running tests like these, and the resulting data sets are both convincing and adorable. Infants spend most of each trial right at the edge of the precipice. They're reaching their arm down over the drop-off. They are putting their little feet or their little hands on the bridge and taking little tiny steps at the edge. And all the while, they're doing it with either neutral or positive facial expressions. What's more surprising is how their approach changes as they learn different forms of locomotion. So what happens is that when babies first begin crawling, they'll crawl right over the edge. Then over weeks of crawling, their responses get more and more accurate until finally they're at adult-like levels so that they can tell precisely whether a slope is safe for crawling or whether a drop-off is safe for crawling. But then the next week, when these babies stand up and face these same drop-offs, same slopes, same apparatus, now as a new walker, they walk right over the edge. So in fact, there seems to be four learning curves in development as babies learn to sit, learn to crawl, as they learn to cruise, and then finally as they learn to walk. So if they were afraid of heights, you should just be afraid of heights. In the rain and on a train and in a tree, you shouldn't see four separate learning curves. So if babies aren't learning to be afraid of heights, what are they learning? I think that what babies are learning over weeks of sitting, crawling, cruising, walking, is they're learning to perceive the relations between their bodies and the environment. They're discovering what's possible and what's just a little too far. And you can learn that without feeling any sort of fear at all. In fact, Eleanor Gibson, the person who first invented the visual cliff, wrote later in her life, as a goat is peering over the edge of a steep crag, it knows not to walk off the edge. And she said, I don't think it's feeling any emotions at all. It just knows not to go. And that's what we're seeing in babies. Who probably know not to go. Probably. For Science Friday, I'm Luke Groskin. Thanks, Caitlin. What does that tell you? I think it's the, for me, it's the evolution that what caught me was the evolution, the four times, right? Um, the walking, cruising, uh, crawling, yeah. and then the learning each time. 
<laughs> Eric, I love that word evolution. Doesn't it feel like our own personal evolution, you know, kind of with these pressures of falling of, of, um, of uh, bruising of, you know, kind of uh, discovering things through experience. And so, so the point I want to make with that video was that, you know, kind of to rise to Eric's challenge, you know, kind of what of the other senses, what you're seeing is the child figuring out what they see vis-a-vis -vis what they propriocept and, um, and with their new motor skills and with each motor skill, she said there were four different learning curves. They had to learn it all over again with each one, you know, kind of this sensing probing, tuning of their brain during that first epoch that Michael Merzenich talked about and um and uh, but customized to their environment and so if their environment has these you know kind of uh visual cliffs then they figure out how to deal with visual cliffs and what a weird thing to have and yet you know kind of their brains plastic enough to be able to figure out when they can how they can deal with the visual cliff as opposed to a real cliff and to distinguish those and and to bring it across and again, tuned to their particular environment, and so um, so that um, so that we evolve in 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 tight correlation with where we are, and um, and how our senses can best discriminate what happens um, around us in as high a resolution picture as possible. And what Eric, you know, Eric's insight is that um, that that high resolution picture has a, a great deal of visual input, but oral input, but tactile input, but sensory input of all types, in order to give us a representation of what reality looks like. Okay, good. So um so let's go back to Michael Merzenich and um and before Caitlin puts up the the next video and it's at 1025 Caitlin when the when the time comes the what he did was um was he did experiments with rats and monkeys and he's going to talk about an experiment with a monkey. And he puts the monkey through um, something in which it has to use a tool, a spoon, in order to pull food towards it. And if it's successful in pulling the food towards it, it gets the reward of the, of the food. And if it's unsuccessful, no food and under certain timed and constrained conditions. But he has the monkey do this 700 times. And what he sees is a learning curve. And so that um, so this is uh, this is an adult monkey. This is not a child monkey, but rather um, a thing. But he sees a learning curve in which initially it's successful once out of twenty times, or I can't remember exactly. But then at the end of the learning curve, gets it every single time, like hardly ever fails. And so that um, so it has the skill completely what we would call mastered. And then what he does is he maps the brain regions and shows what the how the brain regions in the monkey have have changed over the course of this training and um and what to, what we'll see is is that the brain has a finer grained representation of the key two fingers that are necessary for dexterously manipulating this tool and um and the brain has decided like the london cab drivers to over um, over or to devote resources to that particular discrimination, because in that discrimination, it gets rewarded with, uh, with food. And so let's see what uh, Michael Mersenek has to say in terms of that. Go ahead, Katie. The selectivity of responses of the, in the cortex of the monkey, we see that the monkey has actually changed the filter characteristics, which oh. represents input from the skin of the fingertips that are engaged. In other words, there's still a single, simple representation of the fingertips in this most organized of cortical areas of the surface of the skin of the body, the monkey has like you have. And yet now it's represented in substantially finer grain. The monkey's getting more detailed information from these surfaces. And that is an unknown, unsuspected maybe by you, part of acquiring the skill or ability. Now actually we've looked in several different cortical areas in a monkey learning this task. And each one of them changes in ways that are specific to the skill or ability. So for example, we can look to the cortical area that represents input that's controlling the posture of the monkey. We look in cortical areas that control specific movements and the sequences of movement that are required in the behavior and so forth. They're all remodeled. They all become specialized for the task at hand. There are 15 or 20 cortical areas that are changed specifically when you learn a simple skill like this. And that represents in your brain really massive change 
It represents the change in a reliable way of the responses of tens of millions, possibly hundreds of millions, of neurons in your brain. It represents changes in hundreds of millions, possibly billions, of synaptic connections in your brain. This is constructed by physical change, and the level of the construction that occurs is massive. Think of the changes that occur in the brain of a child through the course of acquiring their movement behavior abilities in general, or acquiring their native language abilities. The changes are massive. What it's all about is the selective representations of things that are important to the brain, because in most of the life of the brain, this is under control of behavioral context. It's what you pay attention to. It's what's rewarding to you. It's what the brain regards itself as positive and important to you. It's all about cortical processing and forebrain specialization, and that underlies your specialization. That is why you, in your many skills and abilities, are a unique specialist. A specialist that's vastly different in your physical brain in detail. Can we actually get the... back to that slide the, um, the, with the two points there? So, yeah, perfect. Okay, just a bit forward. It's all about cortical processing. There, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so notice this is now adult neuroplasticity. And so that whereas the baby um, was in an environment and through a kind of Brownian motion figured out its zone of proximal development and gradually wired its brain to become the optimal discriminator of the, of the signals within the environment, what's different about adult neuroplasticity is this selective representation. I will be a hockey player. I will be a musician. I choose to put myself in a rich hockey environment, also known as Canada. And, the, um, and so, that, uh, so that I can develop this selective representation of these inputs and actions and uh, stream and, carry, and, and boil them down so that, uh, so that this is what my brain pays attention to and this is what I wire to. Note the specialization as well. You can't do this for everything. I mean, there, there can be general, generalists and the like. But what we really, really pay, you know, are concerned with in expertise development is this specialization, this ability to narrow things down and then hammer away at it over and over and over again. So that you become so that uh, so that the um, you know kind of new structures become more and more solid within and are able to bring things across. But what strikes me about it a little bit is the common thread to all of it is the active portion of learning as opposed to the passive, and that might be a little too that might be a little too simplistic to say it that way. But it's the purposeful um, pull by the learner because of necessity, because of danger, because of I don't know, hunger, whatever it is, it's the learner that's kind of driving it along more than the teacher, perhaps, um, to interpret their world or gain what they want. I don't know if that's overly, I, I guess I have you reflect on that. I don't know what you, what you think. Yeah. yeah. So that, um, exactly. So that, um, so it can be teacher focused. But when the teacher takes that on, they are taking responsibility for getting you something that's exactly tuned to who you are. And from a constructivist standpoint, and here we'll get into, um, let's do the breakouts in a few minutes, um, Caitlin, the, um, we'll, uh, you know, we'll be able to, you know, um, the individual can fine tune things to themselves in a way that they have the internal conversation going on. They have the internal gains and rewards and the like, and therefore can build it on their own, as opposed to the instructor who has to guess across Across a range of individuals, a range of Connor McDavid's, in order to figure out, you know, kind of whether or not they're, um, you know, uh, they've targeted this well in terms of uh, the way they bring it across. And so the, um, so the, you know, in terms of the educational implications, you know, kind of uh, let's, um, we've got, uh, we've got 10, 12 minutes left. So let's take five minutes. And what, um, what I'm going to put in the chat is, um, you know, how does, uh, how does this ring? Ring with, um, with notions of deliberate practice and, um, or a growth mindset or um constructivism if you want to get really um 
really into the weeds in terms of educational theory. And so that um, so I put these three notions in the chat, but um, but basically what I'd like you to do in the chat, and, and, and Caitlin's going to break us up into three groups, is just talk about the way the implications of this for your educational practice. You know, kind of a what uh, what parts are you doing in your educational practice in terms of shaping the brain of um, of your particular trainees, and um, and to what degree are you um, are you you know kind of really in the job in the in the profession of rewiring brains of trainees, or indeed your brain if it's um, if it's a CPD kind of setup. So what you guys uh, what you guys come up with? I had five people far smarter than I was in my group, uh, and we we had four minutes or five minutes to dig in, but we had a good time mm -hmm. scratching the very surface of uh, of that complexity of growth versus performance, um, mm -hmm. longitudinality as a piece of also deliberate practice. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm saying I'm sure I'm saying things half of uh, what they fully could have been. <clears throat> Well, can I can I call on a special guest, Kent Hecker, and so that um, Kent's in Calgary, and uh, he is a neuroscientist, I would say, and so that um, in terms of uh, looking carefully at the way the brain changes with learning, that to me is uh, is, is along those lines. But um, but Kent, uh, do you have any reflections in terms of the intersection of neuroplasticity with um, with the kind of educations these health professions educators do? Or? Well, well, first, thanks. Thanks, Martin. And, and hello, everyone. Um, great to be invited. And great to participate. Uh, Martin, I would say I'm neurosciences adjacent. My background <laughs> is psychometrics. The individual who is the cognitive neuroscientist here is Phil Cortezzi, who's actually doing a PhD. Hey, Phil. Me, who you will, Martin, you will meet. Um, okay. And has well over 25 years of imaging experience in learning and uh, a, a significant background. So I look at Phil to see whether or not I make mistakes as, as I speak. Um, we are interested in the idea of neuroplasticity, of understanding the changes in the brain as someone goes through the process of, of a health professions program. And actually Phil's PhD is to better understand uh, the baseline within and between individuals as they go over the course of a program. So that's the longitudinal nature, Martin, that I think you will enjoy having conversations about when you come up here in, in a little while. Um, does the brain change? Yes. Does it change due to age? Yes. Can we co-vary out or should we co-vary out due to age as well as expertise on learning as we go through that? Um, these are conversations that we have, that we are discussing, that we are thinking about, um, that we like to start to explore, um, and have been fortunate to have conversations with Martin, such as yourself, with the work that you're doing, as well as, as Phil and his background, more in the cognitive neural sciences. Uh, neuroplasticity is interesting. We, we showed in our fMRI study of 2016 that showed novice expert differences in clinical reasoning on concordant and discordant pieces. And the funny part is Phil's wife, who is also a cognitive neuroscient neuroscientist, looked at me even before we published those results and goes, so what? You're going to show a difference. What does that mean? Can we or should we show interventions in order to get to those different neural profiles, if you were, that are supposed, and I use the term expertise cautiously. The interesting piece will be much like what you're talking about in terms of the education, what are the interventions that will allow us to move people forward, not only behaviorally, or potentially, mm -hmm. with these biometric components, because I worry about whether we should be using these, and how best to use them, um, in order to demonstrate uh, uh, an optimization, if you will, Martin, within within the educational sphere. Yeah, perfect. You know the um. So the idea being, you know, you saw the Merzenich, you know, kind of he could he could look at the pads of the of the monkey's fingers and and show better resolution, and then therefore that might 
be an educational target in terms of you knowing that the skill is there. And um, and Kent and crew have been looking at uh, these EEG caps that show that, um, that somebody is making a visual diagnosis well and, um, and has gained the skill and the like. And so that uh, there's a lot of work to be done, as Kent has alluded to, you know, in terms of the figuring out what is uh, what is wheat and what is chaff from uh, from from an educational standpoint, but um, but really, you know, kind of fascinating stuff. And so to so to wrap up, you know, the um, thank you all for participating. And and what I've tried to do is um, is to suggest that. Um, that uh, this neuroplasticity idea, and we could have unpacked it more, is um, centered on rejecting a fixed mindset and thinking about growth and the idea that you can remodel your brain at whatever age. And um, and the and the other key take home is this idea of the plasticity being think of three different kinds, and so that there's that functional neuroplasticity when you have a stroke or a TBI and the whole bit. And that's not what we talked about today, but there. There's a childhood neuroplasticity that is the tuning and setting up of your brain. And then once it's tuned and set up, there's a new kind of neuroplasticity, which I do think should inform the way we set up um, education. And so for my for my case, in terms of the medical students plastered against the wall in the, um, in the crash room, every single time I advocate for them to be in there because they're learning that um, higher resolution sense of what what the core phenomenon is, and they're starting to tune their own sensors and get their higher resolution sense of it. And so that, uh, so even though I can't measure it, even though I can't, um, I can't uh, demonstrate that that particular experience changed them, I think it does. And that each of those little contributions do change um, our trainees and that, um, and that we should think about it that way from a plasticity shaping each little touch is changing some neuron inside there so again thank you very much for um for joining and um, and uh, next month the the focus will be on visual diagnosis in particular and so that um so we'll be talking about that thank you so much martin and thanks for everyone for joining as well and um and look forward to the next conversation a lot of, a lot we could have even continued on there but it was a great hour so martin appreciate you taking the time putting that together thanks everybody